to Sunday worship at Centenary United Methodist Church. <coughs> Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ to all of you and to any who are following us online this morning. Please silence your cell phone. You have a white response card in your pew in front of you. That was That is for prayer requests. Uh, you can also ask for information about the church, request information, or a phone call. And uh, those cards go in the offering plate later in the service during the offering. There will be a student minister at the altar of the church to pray with any unique prayer at the end of the service. Uh, one change in the order of worship, the hymn sing will be after the doxology, you'll already be standing. So we'll do the affirmation of faith after the sermon and then hymn sing comes down after the doxology. So that's a little change in the order. Uh, we continue our Lenten services this week on Wednesday at noon in here. A communion service followed by lunch downstairs. Hope you'll be able to come to that. Uh, family bingo night is this coming Friday. That's always a lot of fun. Hot dogs at 5.30, bingo starting at 6. There is, a, you have inserts in your bulletin today uh, for Holy Week. Uh, the two that they're inserts for are Lord Is It I, the drama that we put on on Monday, Thursday, which is the 28th this year, and then the Easter egg hunt on Saturday the 30th. Remember that those inserts are for your information. And for other people's invitation, you give them to other people and invite them to come be a part of the wonderful things going on at our church. <clears throat> and that's all I have, except for the mission moment, which Steve is going to present to us if you do it at the pulpit, so you've got a mic. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we know there's great need in our community and a lot of different types of needs, and we know we've all been called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But sometimes it's hard to figure out where we fit in there and, and what the best way for us to serve is. Well, next week there's an opportunity, as you can see from the insert of your bulletin, we're having a mission fair. to be representatives of all these different organizations there that you can talk to to see how you can best serve, either through your time or your talents or, or your resources. So we'd like you next Sunday right after this service to head downstairs to the fellowship hall, enjoy some refreshments, and talk to some of the folks at the organizations that uh, serve our community. Thank you. Thank you. I do have one more thing, and not it is an important thing. Today, after our 11 o'clock service, we will honor Pastor David Brosnan. Uh, who has re-entered retirement. Just a few <laughs> short statistics. You'll hear more at the reception. He served 16 years in the Virginia Conference until 2002. And then uh, he and his wife moved down here in 2010. And uh, he served about eight years here at Centenary. Um, but the interesting thing is he served 16 years and then he served 21 years after his first retirement. <laughs> he served longer after his retirement than he did before it. Which um, it will be interesting to see what happens after this second retirement. <laughs> but uh, please come and welcome him at the reception. And one other thing I'd like to, and I'm going to ask him to stand for this. If he'd stand and face the congregation, I think it's worth you looking them in the eye. <laughs> us. And that is that we, the church has uh, decided that we will honor Pastor David Brosnan as a pastor emeritus. Like oh. Bill Sherman.
Please stand if you're able. Well, let's join together in our opening prayer, which is in your bulletin. <laughs> Loving God, giver of all life and life, you sent Jesus into the world not to condemn, but to save. Help us to lift up the light of our Lord so that the world might believe in him and receive the gift of eternal life. Through Christ, the light of the world. Amen. And our hymn is number 108, God Hath Spoken by the Prophets.
This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Southern Baptist tradition in which I was raised, for example, we focused on two words in John 3.16, believe and perish. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? In evangelical denominations like the Baptist Church, something called the Sinner's Prayer was invented about a hundred years ago. Most people don't know that, by the way, that say that. They think it goes all the way back to the Bible. No, it's been around for about a hundred years. The sinner's prayer has become the most popular way to express belief in Christ. Billy Graham's version of the prayer, the one that he always used in his crusades, goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. If you ever watched a Billy Graham crusade, I actually participated in one uh, as an usher. He asks everybody to say these words with him, those who are all at the altar. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior in your name. Amen. Now, there's nothing wrong with that prayer. It's a good prayer. Evangelicals believe that if they say those words and mean them, they're saved. And to them, saved means that they will go to heaven when they die. That's what it means. You're not going to find the sinner's prayer or any other formula for salvation in Scripture. The belief that saying this prayer is how to be saved is not Christianity. It's magic. Magic is the superstition that saying the right words in the right frame of mind will somehow bend the universe to your will and give you what you want. The second evangelical focus in John 3.16 is the word perish. And they interpret it to mean go to hell when you die. That's what perish means. Evangelicals, by the way, draw heavily on medieval Roman Catholic theology about human nature and eternal reward and punishment. Most of them don't know that that's where that comes from, but that's where it comes from. Conservative Catholics and evangelicals both believe that people are inherently evil and deserve to burn in hell forever. But God loves us anyway, so he sent Jesus to die in our place on the cross. And if we acknowledge that truth, then we won't perish, we won't burn in hell, we'll go to heaven. In other words, they believe that even though God loves us, he is so disgusted with how we live that he wants to punish us forever. But instead of that, he killed his own child, or at least allowed him to die on the wrong cross. Now, people like me and many of you who were raised in the Catholic tradition or the evangelical tradition may not have heard it phrased exactly that way, but that's exactly what we were taught. 
And before you say, well, whatever, preacher, that's what the Bible says, imagine how that sounds to a person who's never heard it before. That God the Father killed his own son in our place because he was so angry at us that he wanted to kill us. And why, apart from unimaginable fear, would anybody ever want to follow a God like that? Is everybody truly evil? Do our sins deserve never-ending torture? And I'm sure there are many people who can proof text those beliefs with a few Bible verses, but does the whole witness of Scripture support the idea that we are, you and I, are so awful that we ought to be burned in unquenchable fire for all eternity? Is the character of the God who is revealed in Jesus consistent with the concepts of total human depravity and eternal condemnation? So let's reread John 3.16 one more time with the evangelical interpretations of believe and perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever prays the sinner's prayer and means it will not burn forever in hell but go to heaven when they die. That's not the way it's worded in John 3.16, but that is the way many, many, many people believe that it reads. <coughs> so do you see what I mean about John 3.16? Not necessarily being salvation one-on-one. -on -one. So much depends on how you interpret Scripture and on what assumptions and on what biases you bring to your reading. Friends, memorizing this verse, as lovely as it is, is not going to save you no matter how you interpret it. It's not a magical formula any more than the sinner's prayer is. There's more to the gospel than John 3.16. For example, John 3.17. So we're going to all say that together now because I know you've memorized John 3.17, right? Everybody's memorized that one. Most of you are thinking right now, uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> no. I know, I know 16. I know, I'm not sure I can remember 17. Why haven't we also memorized John 3.17? Because somebody a long time ago decided it wasn't as important. Here it is. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's kind of an important piece of information, isn't it? <laughs> Do you hear what John is saying? God did not become a human being in order to come down here to the earth and point his finger at us and say, believe or burn. God loves the world. God loves people, in other words. He loves everybody who has ever lived or ever will live. And God saw how miserable we often are and how horribly we treat each other. And then God stepped into the story to show us and tell us in person there is a better way to live. Friends, hell is not just a place where people go after they die. Hell is something that can be experienced in this world. Gaza was already a horrible place to live because of a long blockade before the bombs started to fall. The people of Gaza have experienced for decades shortages of food, water, medicine. And now with bombs killing both the innocent and the guilty, Gaza has become a vision of hell on earth, ranking right up there with concentration camps and dungeons. Relief workers recently spoke to Palestinian children in Gaza and discovered to their horror that kids as young as five years old say they wish they were dead so that the pain and suffering would end. Did you know that? Kids that young. That's hell, folks. Just as hell is also a mother or father helplessly watching their own child die from illness or addiction. Hell is a woman in a psychiatric ward tormented by voices in her head telling her everybody wants to hurt her. I was in that psychiatric ward with a woman one time praying with her and I thought, I can't imagine anything worse than what she's going through right now. Hell is a man writhing in agony in a hospice facility because he has pain that will not respond to medication. Hell is a gay teenager bullied and beaten at school or at home because she has nobody to defend her. Hell is a terrified teacher pushing her second graders into a supply closet to save them from a lunatic with an AR-15. 
Hell is not having enough money to pay for food or medicine or a roof over your head. Hell is not just where we end up if we don't say the right prayer before we die. The God who made us sees us struggling to thrive and sometimes just trying to get by another day. God sees our cancer. God sees our heart problems. God sees our diabetes and our crippling arthritis. God sees our broken bones and our broken hearts and our broken promises. God sees how we hurt each other and hurt ourselves. And God saw all of that and came down into the pain and suffering. God descended into the hell we often make of this world. And in Jesus of Nazareth, God showed us that life does not have to be this way. There is a better way to live. There is a better way to die. The way of Jesus. Given that, can you see what John 3, 16, 3, 17 might have meant to the Apostle John's intended audience, the people who read it to start with, Jews living under Roman occupation in Judea? They already had the way of Moses. They had the law. And the law wasn't wrong. It just wasn't enough. John, or Jesus says in John 13, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By the way, that's one you ought to memorize, along with John 3, 16. <laughs> By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And then later, when he was much older, John wrote this in his letter, 1 John, in chapter 4, verse 7. You may know this verse, also a good one to memorize. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. When John saw his teacher Jesus healing the sick and the injured, when he heard the Lord teaching people to love each other, when he realized that love is what the law was really all about to start with, then John knew that Jesus was God in a human body and that God is love. Friends, to believe in Jesus is to believe in God's unconditional sacrificial love. To know Jesus is to experience that love for yourself. To follow Jesus is to love other people as Jesus has loved you. And so John says in 1 John 4, 16, God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. And so folks, salvation is not just about the life to come, it's about this life too. Salvation starts here and now and lasts forever. It's not only about a decision for Christ, it's about a whole new way of life. Salvation is not a favorite memory verse or a magical prayer. Salvation is a Jewish preacher who fully embodied God's loving essence. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. To open to the possibility that Jesus is real and then to begin to trust in his goodness and his guidance and then to do your best to love as he loved is to move away from the hell that this life can be and toward the heaven it can become by the grace of God. That's what John 3.16 means. And John 3.17 reassures us that God intends not to harm us but to save us. And by the way, if God didn't send Jesus to condemn people, I'm pretty sure he didn't intend for you and me to do it either. So for the love of God, can we please stop pointing a finger at the sins and shortcomings of other people and pay attention to the only folks for whose behavior we are responsible, ourselves. That being said, I have a confession to make this morning. <laughs> Because of my own upbringing, a pulpit-pounding Baptist preacher lives rent-free in my head. <laughs> when you're raised Baptist, that tends to happen. He's still in there. I can hear him every Sunday when I preach. And right now he's saying, Van, read the rest of John 3. Tell him the whole story. So here it is, starting at John 3, 18. 
Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. My inner evangelical wants me to say right now that people who don't believe in Jesus are by default already condemned to hell. That's what he's saying. But my inner evangelical is also a lousy interpreter of Scripture. <laughs> John was a faithful Jew, you see. And he was hurt and disappointed that so many people that he knew not only would not follow Jesus, but eagerly worked to get him crucified. In these last verses of John 3, John is simply lamenting that hearing Jesus' teaching and seeing his miracles wasn't enough to make his fellow Jews believe in him and follow him. He just can't believe that they heard and saw the same things he did and didn't believe in Jesus. John is mad and he is sad that they are making a conscious choice to continue living in hell on earth. They are choosing self-condemnation. That's what this means. My evangelical brothers and sisters preach that anybody who doesn't say the sinner's prayer is going to hell. But they're mistaken because that would mean that Jesus' own grandparents are in hell, right? Because they died before having a chance to know Jesus. They're wrong because that would mean that Adam and Eve and Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and Elijah and all the prophets are in hell because they had the bad luck of being born too early. They're wrong because that would mean that all the people who lived in a time or a place where Jesus was never preached or in hell, even though through no fault of their own, they never even had a chance to believe. They're wrong because that would mean that people who received only a corrupted version of the gospel, all those Jews who were slaughtered by Nazi Christians, are in hell even though their murderers are in heaven. You see, they have to be wrong about this, don't they? God is love. And a loving God doesn't burn people who never had a chance to believe. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't have all the answers, but I don't think I ever told you that I did. <laughs> I can only tell you what I believe after 62 years of life and 28 years of ministry. I can only tell you what my learning and my experience and my relationship with Jesus and my sense of God's spirit have led me to say. And it's just this. God made you. God is with you, and God loves you. God will never abandon you, and you can't make God stop loving you. It is impossible because God is love. And this God who is love was embodied in a civil carpenter who taught and lived the things that I've been telling you for the last 20 minutes. And I know that all sounds too good to be true to some people. I suspect many people hear this kind of news and think it's a fairy tale. They ask themselves, how could God possibly forgive my worst moments? How could God want somebody like me, me, to live in joy and peace and hope? But I tell you today, beloved sons and daughters of the living God, it is true. All of it is true. And you may not believe me now, but try to let go of those doubts if only for a while. Want the good news to be true, even if you can't yet believe it. For those of you who have doubts about this, for those of you who are watching me online and listening, who are not sure about what I'm saying, whether it's true, ask God to show up in your world in a way that you can't mistake for something else. And I promise you, God will show up every time. And when you catch a glimmer of God, take a risk and begin to believe. And your belief will turn into trust. And that trust will turn into a desire to love and forgive other people. A commitment to make the world a little bit more like heaven. Especially when life seems dark and hopeless. Friends, I'll say it again. God is love. And it will be okay in the end. No matter how it ends. So if things are not all okay for you right now, whoever you are, if
it just means that it's not the end yet. And even when your story is over, this short life is only one chapter. Love goes on forever. That is Salvation 101. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is God's gift to you. So open your hearts and open your hands and accept God's gift with gratitude and with hope that his joy and delight in you may be complete. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, you don't have to stand up for the affirmation of faith because you're going to be standing up in a minute for the hymn sing. So if you'll look to the affirmation of faith in your bulletin, we will say together what we believe. We are gods. We belong to the one who creates all things, in whose image all people are made. We are Christ's. We belong to the Lord who has loved us, healed us, called us, and anointed us with his spirit. We are the spirits. We belong to the church, the body of Christ, and promise to live as forgiven and forgiving people. As God's beloved, we are committed to taking part in the healing of the world, guided and empowered by God's spirit. Amen. And God bless you all. come to that time of our service where we share our joys and um, our uh, concerns with one another. Are there joys that we would like to lift up this morning? So yeah. the flowers on the altar given by Janet in Dallas Sutton in honor of music ministries led by Paul ah, Pike. The flowers are given by the Suttons in honor of Paul's music ministry here. Mm -hmm. So that's a joy, right? <laughs> continuing recovery and he has been medically cleared for discharge so they're just waiting to find a bed in a rehab facility close to home. Okay. That's a blessing. Brian's coming home. Wow. So we need to be in continued prayer for him for healing and for Linda as well, I guess. And the family. Mm -hmm. and the, yes. I have a joy in Son. The joy is Susie's surgery went extremely well on Friday. They weren't, they didn't have to replace the whole hip, which mm -hmm. is good. And she'll be home tomorrow. Oh, very yeah. good. Yes. So Sue's surgery went well. I know it's Sue, but uh, <laughs> Susie. Well, and I know, I know. Aunt Susie is <laughs> Aunt Susie to her family and her friends. We'll call her Susie. Yeah. Um, has come home. Yeah. She's doing well. Yep. Healing prayers for her. Yep. Sue Harrell. And my concern is for my sister Aunt Monica and my Aunt Katie, who's um, battling the early onset of dementia mm -hmm. at 61 years old. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. is battling hard, and we hope that God takes her fast and goes oh. home. Oh. Oh. So my dear. sister Aunt Monica is not doing great. And I hope that God does what he needs to do. Mm -hmm. We'll be in prayer for your family and Margaret and for Katie, right? Mm -hmm. Are there concerns, other concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? He was a family of Wayne Anderson. His uh, grandson passed away. Okay, Wayne Anderson. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kelly, who's dealing with cancer? In here for Kelly. Unknown chapter. Okay. <laughs> Unknown chapter is Pastor <laughs> David, yes. <laughs> well, we definitely want to be uh, praying for Charles Sike as well, and the family, and all of those who are chronically ill or in pain. We want to be in prayer for those recovering from surgery or facing surgical procedures, which includes Steve Russ. We want to be in prayer for all those at home who are, cannot be with us here today. 
Uh, particularly this morning, we lift up Sherry Parker. We want to pray for all those in rehab, nursing homes, care facilities, those grieving loss, which this is the uh, week would be the family of Jean Emmons. We want to be in prayer for uh, all those places in conflict around the world, particularly Gaza and Israel, Ukraine and Russia. We want to be in prayer for the people who have not yet recovered from COVID, who are maybe suffering long COVID syndrome or uh, suffering financially, educationally. Let us go to God in prayer. Today, friends, I ask you to do something hard. Pray for those for whom this world has little or no respect. Pray for people who anger and disgust us. Pray for them because God loves each one of them just as much as he does each of us. And it's not God's will that even the worst scoundrel should perish. Pray for them because if we don't, nobody else will. Let us pray. God of the whole family, we pray for habitual liars, for gossips, for drug addicts, and drug dealers, for alcoholics, for gamblers, for those who cheat on their spouses, and those who steal from their own families. We pray for violent gangs, for rebellious kids who run away from good homes, for those who milk the welfare system, for the wealthy who cheat on their taxes, and for those who cheat the elderly out of their life savings. We pray for prostitutes, pimps, and their customers, for pedophiles, those who traffic and exploit vulnerable people for sex work, and those who exploit undocumented immigrants in factories and on construction sites, and farms, and ranches. We pray for racists, and sexists, and homophobes, and every other kind of bigot. For the rich who look down their noses at the poor. We pray for tyrants <coughs> and dictators, for spies and assassins and traitors, for terrorists in many lands, for criminal bosses and hitmen, for rapists, stalkers, seducers, and those who commit domestic violence. We pray for bank robbers and embezzlers, shoplifters and vandals, con men, pickpockets, hackers, and identity thieves, and home invaders who beat and kill people in their homes. We pray for people who abuse positions of trust or power, for corrupt attorneys and judges, doctors and nurses, politicians, teachers, police officers, prison guards, priests, rabbis, pastors, imams, and gurus. Loving God, as we consider all those for whom we feel no sympathy, but only revulsion, Please keep us from becoming bitter and vengeful. Make us more eager for the redemption of the worst among us than their destruction. When we feel overwhelmed by the enormity of suffering and evil in the world, when we too easily see the hell in front of us, lift our eyes, O oh God, to the signs of your life among us, to the touch of your healing on our souls. To the cross that casts its liberating shadow across all human affairs. We need our eyes to be lifted, God, so our hearts may be filled with faith and hope and love and cleansed of fear and hate and condemnation. As always, God, Hear our prayers for those whose names and situations 
we either named aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray as a family, one family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us return to God the gifts that God first gave us. Will the usher please come forward? <laughs> Thank you. 
return your gifts to you. Multiply them, use them for your kingdom, and by your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and ministry to all the world. Amen. So we're going to have a hymn sing this morning here. And how about if we stand, remain standing for this hymn, whichever the first selection is, and then maybe seated for the, yes, for the next two. Does that sound, yes, <laughs> yes? Okay, who wants to call out the first hymn this morning? 357, verses oh. 1 and 2. Dan's ready. 357, verses 1 and 2. A good feeling for you to call.
Thank you for joining us in worship today at Centenary United Methodist Church. If you'd like to know more about Centenary, go to www.centenarychurch.com. If you'd like to speak to me or another staff member, you can reach us at 252-637-4181. Or if you'd like to visit us, come to 309 New Street in beautiful Newburn, North Carolina. God bless you, and remember, God loves you.